So, I, like I said, I messed up like a thousand dollars of my own money, and I was just like, "Super." That's how you do it, man. I mean, you, you pay it. <laughs> you, you pay it one way or the other. You either pay someone who's already wasted the thousand, or you pay the we waste the thousand yourself. <laughs> that, that's what, I, I wish somebody had told me that. You are now listening to the Creative Juice Podcast, brought to you by Entrepreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to Creative Juice. Uh, I'm your host, Circa, and Corinne is not with me today. She's actually in London at the time of this release, I believe, uh, touring, so that's super cool. But this gives me a chance to kind of slow down and interview some people that we've definitely wanted to interview for a while, but we just don't have a whole lot of time in the production schedule. And I'm super excited because today I have a gentleman who I watch I, I watch every one of his videos, um, and he's featured on a on another channel that I'm also a huge fan of but every time I see one of his videos in this channel I know it's him before I even open the video because he's got such a keen focus on the kind of like hard numbers and digital marketing that that we talk about here on this podcast so I'm super excited to introduce Corey DeSavior right that's the full yes sir yeah, Corey DeSavior. We, 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 we can just do Corey for short man Corey is right. cool hell yeah <laughs> man well good to have you on Creative Juice man Thank you, man. I appreciate you for having me, bro. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy that you say you watch our videos, man, because I feel like I don't know how long you've known about the Brand Man channel, but I feel like I knew about you first. Like, I feel like I was watching <laughs> your stuff first. <laughs> Word. Yeah. Uh, so earlier this year when we got into YouTube, um, I basically hired <clears throat> my friend who also does like a whole lot of Spotify playlisting and stuff. He was like, yo, here's all this stuff you could be doing with YouTube. Like, you don't know, you know, like what you got here. Like you, you need to try all this stuff. So I was like, dude, just go and like, <clears throat> show me what's good. And one of the channels he followed from our channel was your guys. And he was like, just watch these videos. And, um, and then I started watching and I like, I love this stuff and, pretty much like nothing that brand man says I really like disagree with, you know, it's not like the same sort of like nerdy digital marketing type stuff that I usually, you know, dive into, but he's always yeah. on point. And then I started seeing your videos pop up and I was like, this dude knows digital marketing. <laughs> <laughs> that, I, I think that's the cool thing about our channel is like Sean has a lot more of like the, the conceptual stuff down than I do. Like Sean is able to kind of take like uh, an idea and break it down into multiple theories like way better than I can. You know what I'm saying? Like like yeah. way, way better than I can. Whereas like I'm that that's exactly I feel like my role in the channel is like, all right, cool. Sean comes with the with the really, the really good concepts, the actionable brand ideas, and then boom, I come behind with like the hard number shit. Like, this is how you're gonna get this done. This is what it's gonna look like to scale this. Like, so it's cool, man. We have a we we have a we have an interesting dynamic on the channel, man. Yeah, man. It's definitely interesting to watch. And I and I love that because like I have that kind of relationship with a buddy of mine who's like a musician and also markets himself. And he's all, he, like, he pays super close attention to like all the news and like what's going on in the industry. And he knows everyone's push and how they did it and you know, what strategies they're using. And I just like, I'm just paying attention to like old school, like direct response marketing. And so it's nice mm -hmm. to have that to like balance me out. But how did you, so, okay, I want to like kind of get your whole story. Cause I don't have it. This is actually the first time we've talked on the phone for anyone who's listening. So I've, I've got a bunch of like preliminary questions, but number one, how did you first get into marketing music? So my, my very first industry job was I used to work for a publicist. So that's kind of how I got into the game. Um, I was like his intern, you know, doing all the publicist shit, like running to get food, typing up press releases, looking over like emails, all that stuff. And then I would say maybe like a year and a half after we started working together, him and a friend started like a little um, boutique record label. It's pretty much like a guy with money and a guy with a bunch of music connections came together to form like this, this kind of like Megatron-esque record label. That's awesome. And that was, that was probably my first time like really dealing with like marketers, like dealing with the marketing teams that they were hired because usually I would have to be on like the phone calls, taking notes, so just like kind of going through that whole motion with them. That was kind of the whole thing that kind of like started showing me how much money it really takes to, to spend shit, you know, to get shit going in the music industry. So I say maybe fast forward about a, a year and a half after that, I move out to Atlanta and I started managing this rapper that I met in class. So it was with him that I really started to really, really start to see like, okay, this is the stuff that's needed to like move, move artists. So 
um, we had a conversation with this agency one day who wanted to take him on as a client. And so I'm on the phone with them and they're like, yeah, man, you know, we can do all these things for you. We can get you shouted out on Instagram pages. And I'm like, man, like I can get you, I can get him shouted out on Instagram pages. They're like, you know, we can, we have access to all these big Twitter accounts who can do reposts. I'm like, I have access to all these big Twitter accounts that can do reposts. And then they're like, well, you know, we also, we know, we also know how to, um, at the time, this is when Spotify playlisting, it wasn't like a big thing yet, but it was like just starting to like really creep onto the scene. And like, yo, man, we can get you on these Spotify playlists. And I'm like, man, I feel like if you, if two out of the three things you told me that you can do, I can do. I feel like the third <laughs> thing and whatever else is it won't be that hard for me to start figuring out. So it was really after that conversation, I just started kind of like dive into just like the concept of marketing. Like I'm not a trained marketer by any means. I didn't go to school for this. I just really like took what I understood from a social media level and like reverse engineered it. So when I first started my marketing agency, the only thing, the only platforms that I worked were YouTube, Instagram, and Spotify. And that was because I recognized that, okay, how do I find music on YouTube? Cool. I found this guy because an influencer put his song in this video. Or I found this guy because Rap Nation posted him and it came up on my feed. You know, something like that. So then I just kind of reverse engineered it and was like, all right, let me go find and, you know, gain access to all these platforms that these other people are doing. Uh, same way with Instagram. I was like, okay, how do I find stuff on Instagram? This meme account posted it, and that's how I know about it. Or this this music account posted about it, and that's how I know about it. So then I started to build out my network and kind of like, you know, gain access to these pages as well. The only thing I really wasn't too deep into at the time was the Spotify playlisting. Um, but I hopped into it one because like I said, it was new. It, it wasn't like super new, but like I said, it was, it was before like every artist in the world knew like I need to be on a Spotify playlist. Right. It was like that early. And I had went to an A3C conference and I actually met, um, Tuma, Tuma Basa, who's like the guy that's responsible for starting Rap Caviar, like the biggest rap playlist on Spotify. Yeah. And so we were kind of, we were kind of chopping it up. You know, I'm doing, this is when I'm still managing the rapper. So like I'm, I'm, I'm doing manager shit. Like I'm like, yo man, my artist is pretty lit. You know, he has, at the time, he had like a quarter million streams on like SoundCloud, and I'm showing it to him. And he's like, "Oh, bro, this is cool, but Rap Caviar may not be the place for him. You should try looking into other Spotify playlists." I'm like, "What do you mean?" He's like, "Like there are other playlists out there. You should look into them." <laughs> Without like really like really saying too much about it, and I'm like, "Okay, like I don't I don't completely understand what he means, but all right, cool, I'll figure it out." And one of the main pages that I had a good relationship with. Um, he was, he was working a, a, a Spotify playlist he created at the time and he referred me to a friend he had that already had like a pretty, um, sizable playlist. It probably had like 15 K at the time. Right. Um, and then he was like, he was like, yeah, man, my friend does playlisting, you know, reach out to him. And I got my artist put on the playlist. He probably got about 15, 20,000 streams over the course of like a month. And I was like, oh yeah, okay, cool. This is something else I need to like dive into and figure out. Right. And so bro, I just, I just like used to spend like four hours four or five hours every day after work just like building out my spotify playlist network my instagram um account network and my youtube account network and like influencer network and then one day i just was like all right man i think i'm ready um let me tell people i have a marketing agency and then you know jump in the field and figure it out and that's how i got into it man <laughs> that's that's amazing dude well like when i watch your okay so i want to back up um <clears throat> so when so you first got a taste of marketing by working as like correct me if I'm wrong but the point man for a client to a marketing agency right yeah yes well well really with that that label that my my um my first like mentor started because I, I wasn't handling marketing right. things then but but I would be on all the marketing phone calls You'd be like, on the call the market. Yeah. yeah like the marketing phone calls were how I learned that radio costs like six figures like hearing it Hearing uh, the iHeart people go like, yo, it's going to cost this much, you know, iHeart. I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. There's a whole nother world out here I didn't know about. But yeah, that, that, it pretty much was like being point man between people to these other agencies. Well, it's interesting because we've had, you know, we, we run an agency called IndieX and we've had, yeah. we've had like several, you know, kind of higher profile artists who, you know, the manager's not even going to be on those calls all the time. Definitely not the yeah. artists, and it's usually a point person, and they seem to start picking up exactly what we're putting down to the point where, like, they, you know, like they're heading towards like a job transition because they now are imbued with all these marketing skills. So it's hilarious that that, that kind of happened for you as well. Um, so okay, so so that was your first exposure. Now, there's kind of 
you know, we, we, we seek to illustrate how business marketing and specifically like direct response stuff is kind of transferable to the music industry in a way that not a lot of people realize, but we're starting to see a merger of that. Like we see like, you know, Spotify playlists that are built with smart Facebook advertising. Mm -hmm. So you're taking a very like music industry type marketing that doesn't have much of like a trackable method behind it. But then you're like chaining up traffic generation that's from a different style of marketing. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a lot of like blending and stuff. Have you had a lot of exposure to, cause you talk a lot about ads on the channel and stuff and like your ad knowledge is pretty up there compared to the average music industry marketer. How did that happen? My first real point of contact with ads was maybe like two years ago. I ran a YouTube ad for the artist I was managing and it was like too good to be true. So we were really skeptical of it. Like it was something like I spent like $40 and maybe got like, I don't know, maybe like 15,000 views or something. And it was like, like we were just so skeptical of it. Cause it was like, it was mind blowing to us. Um, but like fast forward to now, I really first started diving into it. Maybe like last December, um, I took a Skillshare course on Hell yeah. Yeah, on Facebook marketing. And then like the very next day I had like a Facebook ad client, a client that wanted to do it. And I kind of like worked out a lot of the kinks with that. What really pushed me to kind of, I guess, to really get, I guess, as knowledgeable as I am about it now is maybe like three weeks after that, I was out, I was really cocky about that campaign. So like I said, it's my first Facebook ad campaign. It does like really well. Like the guy gets maybe like 80,000 views on his video out of like Facebook to, um, to YouTube. Um, so it's doing like really well. So I'm really cocky about it. So I'm thinking like, okay, I, I, I figured out the sauce. Let me run some ads for myself, like for my business, for my products I'm selling. And, you know, and let me figure stuff out. Right. So long story short, I probably end up blowing about like a thousand dollars on like terrible ads. Like, they, they, cause I, <laughs> right. didn't, I didn't, I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. Now knowing what I know, I just got lucky on the first campaign. Like I happened to pick the right objective and it worked out for me. But if you had asked me then why I picked that objective, I couldn't have explained it to you. So I, like I said, I messed up like a thousand dollars of my own money. And I was just like, Super. that's how you do it, man. I mean, it's, you, you pay it, you, you pay it one way or the other. You either pay someone who's already wasted the thousand or you pay the, we waste the thousand yourself. That, that's what, but I, I wish somebody had told me that in December. Cause like I was, yeah. I was, I was so depressed about it, bro. Like, it, it, like that really hurt me. Like I was just like ass out of a thousand dollars for like a good like month. And so that was the point where I was like, man, this is something that people want. I know it works because I've seen it work. Let me just like figure out how to learn more about it. So, I mean, probably since then, I would say top of January, once I kind of made that money back, I just have, like periodically invested over it in different courses over those months. So like I bought, I actually bought a course from you guys. Um, I bought something from, have you, have you seen this guy on Instagram named James the Guru? Are you familiar with him? I do not, I do not know okay, so, them, no, so, or him. Yeah, so I bought, <laughs> I bought his course, I bought your course. Um, I, I had a friend who had the Ty Lopez course, so I got to see like some face Facebook advertising from like a business side. And then there was there's, there's one more person. I can't remember who the fourth person was, but pretty much I probably spent about like five or six thousand dollars on courses over like January to about April. Um, and then I just like came back like in May with all this newfound knowledge. And then like just like you said, started te first I started testing out my own money with friends just to see if the information I learned was like applicable. And then once I got really comfortable with it, I just was like, all right, man, um, I'm about to gas up some people I know using Facebook advertising. And, and it's, it's Perfect. crazy. Yeah. It's crazy because, like, man, since I started doing it, the whole ads, just Facebook and YouTube ads have become my favorite marketing tool since I figured out how to do it. There's, yeah. 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 Once you crack that code, it's like, oh, with these hands, I make fire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, man. And, it, it's, and it's like it's the least it's the least sketchy marketing tactic out there if you know what you, you know what I'm saying? like like playlisting you have the the fear of running into like a, a fake playlist influencers you got you got the risk of like the influencer either scamming you and taking your money or like you know worse even worst case or i guess equally as worst case they haven't posted in like a week and the engagement is trash and it's not worth the money but it's like with facebook ads or youtube ads it's like yo you set this up you get it right and then you just keep feeding it and you're good so like i've become a, yeah. a, a huge believer of that like w one of the the biggest things for me is like like because you know a lot of music industry marketing methods have their place and like just like you were talking about like it's amazing 
the convergence of different like th- you know skills and like you know like some things that were black hat have now have like a white hat spin on them to a degree. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's crazy is that like um, uh, almost all of the music industry marketing methods don't have a return path. Like there's no way to follow back up with those people who successfully went through the campaign. Mm-hmm. So like, so like, you know, for instance, if I like do a Spotify playlisting campaign, I might get tons of fans, but I can't communicate with them except by like uploading songs on Spotify unless they commit like a whole bunch of manual actions yeah. to like end up somewhere I can communicate with them, which like a lot of them will, but it's not as certain as like with a Facebook ad, like, okay, whether I'm sh- showing them a video or getting them to click over to a page, everyone who does the thing I want them to do. I can separate them from the rest of the pack and just talk to them, which means that I can actually create like a narrative. Like I can fucking start at the beginning and genuine, like genuinely ascend them through different levels of like a relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's so hard to do with the traditional methods Mm -hmm. in in the industry. Yeah. That, and it's like, you you can scale it, right? Like it's, it's it's hard to scale a playlist campaign. It's like, if I found six playlists that get you, you know, a bunch of streams, that doesn't mean I can find six more just like them. And then a lot of curators don't like to do like multiple song placements in the same playlist. So it's like, oh man, they, you've kind of hit this ceiling. Same with literally everything else except for pay advertising. Like pay advertising, I can go, all right, cool. We got you great results off of $1,500. Come back to me with 5,000 and we're going we gonna to start a forest fire. You know what I'm saying? We're going to burn everything down. Like <laughs> that's all we need to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, I agree. That's that's crazy, actually. So, okay, so how did you meet Brandman? How did I meet Brandman? Um, so going back to the artist I was managing. So Sean, Sean used to throw a festival out here in Atlanta called Adventure ATL. Um, like I learned about it. I think my first year living in Atlanta was like his second year doing it. Um so I didn't even, but this is before I even knew he had a YouTube channel. So like I went to the event. I remember seeing him there. He probably wouldn't remember seeing me, but I remember seeing him there. Um, but the artist I was managing at the time was a really big fan of the channel. Like he, I remember one day he just DM'd me. He was like, yo, you need to like, he's like, I don't know what this guy can do, but we need to get in contact with him. Like we need to, <laughs> we need to talk to him. Um, so I ended up following Sean on Instagram, just like kind of chopping up with him. And then I pitched my artist for the festival that he had. So I'm like, yeah, man, I actually manage this rapper. He's pretty cool. You know, um, you should check him out. We love to come do the show. And he's like, all right, man, you know, I'll put you through the process. We'll see what's up. So fast forward, I would say maybe, maybe like three or four months after that, there was this conference going on out here called like the sports and entertainment conference, something, something they do at one of the colleges out here. And like, I went to it and I saw him there and I walk up and I'm like, yo, man, you brand man Sean, right? He's like, you know, really awkward. You know, when people recognize you like that. Yeah. Like, I'm like, oh yeah, man, really big fan, <laughs> really big fan of the channel. We chopped it up in the DMs about my artist being on your festival. He's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, that's what's up. That's dope. We talked for a little bit. He hits me back maybe like two weeks later, tells me my artist is, is on it, um, which by this time I wasn't managing the artist anymore, actually. So he hits me back, the guy's on it. And we just end up talking at the festival. So I still go to support because I like the event. So we go, we're talking, we're talking. Um, He hits me up maybe like, I don't know, maybe like a month after that. And I was like, yo, man, you want to meet? Because, oh, let let me back up. So in between this, I'm just starting to get into my content game. I wasn't making videos, but I was writing like blog articles on Medium. So I, I, he would kind of keep up with me and be like, oh, yeah, bro, I actually read this. You made a good point. Or like, oh, this was pretty dope, like where you took this direction. So about a month after that event, he, he hits me up and asks me what I like to meet and you know, just get lunch and chop it up. I'm like, yeah, you know, why not? I ain't got nothing to do. I like that YouTube channel. You know, let me go chop it up with one of my favorite YouTubers. And while we're at the lunch, he's telling me like, yeah, man, um, I'm planning on relaunching the channel because at, at this time he had shut down the channel for a little bit. I think just due to some personal reasons. And he hadn't been posting for a while. So at this meeting, he's just like, yeah, man, you know, I've been seeing the stuff you put out. You seem like a pretty knowledgeable guy. Um, I want to bring you on the channel. And at the time, I'm kind of like, man, I don't know, man. You know, I'm not really a camera guy. Um, you know, I have this really this really thick accent. I don't think I'm the clearest speaker. All these excuses that, like, looking back on it was stupid. But all these excuses. And then Sean was just kind of like, man, look, bro, like, what's, what's cool about the educational space is as long as the information is there, like, as long as you are genuinely trying to give them the best information you know, 
they will get they will get over it and they will kind of let you like grow into the process. And he was right. He's been completely right about that. Um, but so like he was I, dead right. He was yeah. dead. Yeah, exactly, man. Like I, I mean, I, I even think about, but my very first videos, me and my like roommate were shooting them on like his phone. Like we used to use his phone to record a video, and then I would stack up these books on top of like this bucket we had and use my phone as the microphone because I didn't have any like equipment. I didn't have a camera, I didn't have a, I didn't have anything. Like I agreed to do it. I didn't tell Sean I didn't have any equipment. I just was like, yeah, I'll do it. And then I just like jumped into it and figured it out as I went. I, I remember like, this is actually a nerdier example, but like uh, one of the, so there's a podcast called I Love Marketing. Do you, do you know of it? I heard about them through you. Okay, well, yeah, yeah. So they're like old school direct response guys, like back in the days of direct mail and copywriting and shit. Mm. And one of them is this guy, Dean Jackson. And they have like a $25,000 like mastermind that like everybody's in, you know? So it's crazy. Like they're big. And when I went on Dean Jackson's podcast, like I, I think I had to like take like a shot of whiskey beforehand <laughs> just to like kind of calm my nerves <laughs> because I was like, dude, I've been listening to this guy for like 300 episodes that are all like an hour and a half mm. over the last like, you know, three years. That's like, dope. You know? Yeah. It's crazy to meet to meet people who like you've gotten so much value from, mm -hmm. and then they're just like regular folks. <laughs> and, then, and then for them to ask you to bring extra value, like it's like, man, like I thought yeah. you, you want me to to bring some value. Like, all right, cool, man. If you want it, you know, let's do yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's fire. Yeah, man. It's also dope to see people, you know, kind of like rise up with like w when you're in the educational space and someone gets value from you and they use it in a way that like you wouldn't have or couldn't have like mm -hmm. that's so dope too yeah, yeah but um but yeah okay so building on that so what uh so tell me a little so you run a lot of this is the major thing that I wanted to ask you run cuz we run mainly like Facebook ads mm -hmm. and I know you do too but you do you seem to do a lot more YouTube advertising than we traditionally do so mm. tell me extol to me the values of uh, YouTube advertising. Yeah, man. I think YouTube is really good. Uh, one, one YouTube is king, man. I, I have this like theory that like I'm working on proving out that the holy trinity of platforms is Instagram, YouTube, and Spotify. Like I tell my artist friends, like if you can conquer one or all three of those platforms, you'll be in a really good position. Um, you know, like a really, really good position. But uh, YouTube, I feel like is is a is better for like really niche targeting targeting. So it's like anyone that's familiar with running Facebook ads, you know that everything you want to target is in the keyword, right? So like I'll get artists sometimes who like their demographic is so specific, I can't go to Facebook because my cost per ads would be way higher than I want them to be. But on YouTube, um, with anyone who's not familiar with YouTube ads, you have the ability to target your video to any video that exists on the YouTube platform. So if someone comes to me and is like, yo, my demo my fan base likes these 10 artists and I may have never heard of these 10 artists in my life, but you know what I know how to do? I know how to go out and find 500 videos from these artists and run ads to those videos and then start to build within that, build within that. Um, so like in a, in a, in a perfect situation when a client has the budget, I like to do both because I think Facebook and Instagram ads does a lot better as far as like shareability. YouTube isn't really the place where like you, you don't go to YouTube and go like, Oh, this video is cool. And you share it with everyone. You can't just like, like it, save it to your watch ladies and move on. But with Facebook, Instagram, that's, that's what it's made for, right? Like it is the platform where people like to share everything they come across. So I think Facebook is better than that, but YouTube, man, YouTube is crazy, man. Like I've gotten like, like insane results out of my my best like YouTube advertising campaigns, like things I, I've never gotten on Facebook. And it's just like, just being able to build yourself in the niche alone, like controlling how you build yourself out in that niche, um, I think is like way more doable with YouTube and YouTube ads, like way more. Hmm. That's it. That's super interesting, man. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I do love, I, I do love the targeting options, like being able to target specific channels, specific search terms, specific videos, even that is huge. It's a lot of manual work per client. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. But, um, but it is dope. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I know we've done it in the past, but what we traditionally use just Google's entire ad ad platform for is retargeting mm -hmm. just like when we want to be like sort of like omni channel. Um, but that's dope, dude. I, I, I mean, I've definitely seen them work wonders in the past. Um, 
and I, I love watching your videos about YouTube advertising. They definitely make it seem a lot easier than it typically has been for me setting up campaigns, you know? I, I mean, I, I'll say, like, I won't take all the credit for it. Like I said, um, I learned a lot of it just from some of those courses I took and then going out and fucking up my own money. Um, but I, I, yeah. I will say this is it is, like you say, it's more time intensive than anything. Like it probably takes me, it probably takes me about three to four hours to find all the videos I use, I use for my YouTube act. I have help now. So like it maybe splits down to about two hours a piece for between me and my business partner. Um, but right. I tell people all the time, a lot of things that we do in marketing are not hard. They are just tedious as fuck. Like they're just really, really tedious. And once you get over the tediousness totally. and you have the time to do it, um, and you don't even need us. Well, sometimes you need us, but you don't always need us for everything. You just need to put the time into it. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So in terms of like this sort of like Holy Trinity idea, right? We have Instagram, YouTube, and Spotify. Mm. Now, I love, I love Instagram. I'll love it. You know, like I, one of the big challenges we have with Instagram is the lack of audience, like a uh, custom audience, mm -hmm. um, like granularity with the platform. Um, the video limit poses certain challenges. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then just like the lack of like, it's not, obviously it's not as robust in terms of like placements and, and all the different things you can do with it. But I feel like it's on the cusp of being there. Mm -hmm. Like once Instagram direct message is integrated with Facebook messenger, once, you know, uh, once we open up like the custom audience targeting for Instagram, mm -hmm. I think it's going to be like, it's going to be like, why advertise on Facebook once it's at that place? But yeah. kind of like describe to me the interplay between these. Like, do you have, because for us, like the central point is like email. Like before that, we're trying to get you to email. After that, like we're trying to get you to customer, but you're in, you're in the email list. Just so you have a new tag, right? And some value associated. Like, so what's you, is that your central point as well? Is like some kind of one-to-one -one communication or are you trying to build up sort of like top of funnel audiences on these three platforms? Yeah, so that one. Um, it, just because I, most of the artists I end up dealing with, um, they don't have the team nor the resources to handle like email marketing. Okay. Um, some of them do, the ones that do, that's the direction I push them is like, let's point all of these platforms towards this, something that I know that you are realistically managed. Um, but right. outside of that, I'm, I'm a big fan of like, so all of my clients and just like people I work with, I try to like coach them through the whole process. My big philosophy is like, if you work with me, I'm going to try to teach you a little bit of what I know. So that if you get into a position where you can't afford to hire me again, you at least won't like have completely wasted my time by killing off the momentum that we built up. So Absolutely. what I, what I always try to do is I always try to say like, okay, cool. What platform are you the strongest in? So I've had clients who like dominate on YouTube, but they're ass at Twitter and they're ass at Instagram and vice versa. I've had clients who dominate on Twitter and they suck at YouTube or, you know, I have, I have clients now who dominate on TikTok and they suck at everything else. And I tell them, <laughs> like, all right, that, that's cool. You have the benefit of time. So let's take the time out to build up one platform at a time until you get to a point where either you're so comfortable with it that everything kind of moves on autopilot or you built up a sizable enough fan base there that we can kind of afford to go here and focus on something else. And the reason I do that is because, like I said, going back to them not having a team is like, I don't want to overwhelm them. Like, I don't want to be like, yo, let's grow your YouTube, Instagram, Spotify, point them out to your email list so you can do this because most of them aren't going to do it. Like, they're going to like, right. they're going to give up at the second phase in the funnel. So if I'm like, all right, cool, let's build up your Instagram. Let's you know, take two or three months to build out your Instagram. Cool, you're kind of comfortable there. All right, let's move on to your YouTube. Cool, you're kind of comfortable there. Then let's start pointing both of those at your email, start building up your email list. Let me kind of walk you through that process. Cool, you got something there. Boom, now we can go, we can fire off all cylinders at the same time and run into everything. Because now I've coached you through the process. You're comfortable with each of these platforms. And now I should be able to do everything I want to do without, um, without it being messed up from like, either lack of understanding of what I'm trying to do or lack of time to handle what I'm trying to do. Um, so that, that, like I said, my big thing, man, just, just from the point of getting them not to give up is like, all right, cool. I'm not going to overwhelm you with, you know, how much more effective email marketing can be. I'm not going to, I'm not going to throw all these numbers at you. You are good at Instagram already. 
cool. Let's build your Instagram up because you already know what's up there. It's easier to coach you through it. It's easier to get you more comfortable. Um, I mean, it's not the best as far as like reaching how you can push them to other things, but it's a start, you know what I'm saying? And I feel right. like the most important thing is just to get them started. Once they get started, we can figure everything else out. So, so like, I know that like, especially, and these are like industries that like all my friends are in, in like the hip hop, pop, and like electronic, but like really modern electronic kind of like wave. The the kind of incentive is is to like go all top of funnel, and then your one monetization play is like record deal, and then maybe later on down the line, it's like merchandise, you know. Um, mm. So like you know, artists are focused on building up a huge top of funnel like public awareness that they can then cash in on with the right contract, mm-hmm. and. You know, we we deal primarily with independent musicians who are intent on staying independent. So, like the monetiz- that's not exactly a monetization pathway they're comfortable with. They might be looking more for like sync licensing representation or something like that. But is there like is there any sort of way in terms of like when you're coaching these artists, you're working with these artists on the way to a monetization that is like probably larger, say like a record deal? Is like what are the monetization pathways for you guys? Yeah, mostly merchandising. Um, okay. So building up, you know, the the thousand customer list or a couple hundred. Um, that's usually where I try to start them. And then usually trying to capitalize like the brand awareness into some type of streams um, on whatever platform is working best for them. So like most of the people who I work with, they're like really starting to make money. They make a large majority of their money off of streams. And then yeah. rap is a little, I think rap, I don't know if rap, I wouldn't say it's different in other genres, but I feel like a, a really like popping rapper will start to get booked for paid shows um, pretty consistently. Like if they know how to work themselves in different markets. So I have some people who are starting to get paid off of like features right. now, or they're starting, to get, they're starting to get booked for certain show opportunities. But I try to point them to the things they can control, which are merchandising and, you know, pushing people out to their streaming platforms. Totally. I'm trying, I, I have a couple, I have a couple people who have like some really interesting ideas on like, I don't want to like give them out, but like some of them fall into like subscription service ideas. I have a couple of them who like, who like, um, Shit, like music is kind of like very similar to how we do YouTube. It's just a means to getting attention to the other stuff they do. Um, it's wild, man. But the merchandising thing, I think, is merchandise. What I try to push most people to because I'm like, man, if you have a fan base, if you have a, if you have 500 fans, and like 60 of them will buy something for you, and you have the design savvy to like, in 30 dollars to build a really nice Shopify store, like you will start making money. You know, yeah, um, like making making money that you can put back out into hopefully making more money. Um, like I said, going back to my, my, I have a friend, really good friend of mine who's, who's an artist and he's really just now starting to like come up. Like I've known him for maybe about two or three years, but this past year he had a video go viral on YouTube and it kind of like popped off a lot of things for him. And so we were having that conversation of, I'm telling him like, man, you probably have a solid like, I would I would guess that he probably has a solid like three to five thousand like real fans um, based on like what I could see, yeah. and so I'm trying to push him to the point I'm like yo like monetize that fan base like if if you have three thousand fans two hundred and fifty of them will buy something I promise you like somebody somebody will buy something if you make it right and you push it out and his big thing was he was afraid that he would monetize everything too early and he's like I don't want to like I don't want to put like shit product out there I don't want my base to feel like I'm just trying to make money off of them. And the thing, and it's not the first time I hear it. I heard it from other clients too, or just other artists in general. And so the point I try to, I try to put them, I'm like, man, like your fans, your real fan base will not feel that way because they understand that as an artist, you need money to continue doing what you have to do. And they will gladly fund the operation that's going to keep you giving them what they want from you. But f- furthermore, like nobody th- even thinks about it. Like yeah, I've exactly. never <laughs> bought a band t-shirt or something I thought was dope and been like, I'm giving this fucking guy money. Like, no one yeah. thinks that. <laughs> they're just like, yo, they're just like, yo, I love your music and this t-shirt is cool. Take my $30. But the the, the way I got him to like, I don't, I still don't know if he sees out of with me on the yet because he hasn't started making merch. But the day I saw the light bulb click in his head was I went to this, this concert 
for this um, artist out here. Her name is Baby Rose. So, like, she's this R&B singer. She's just starting to make a lot of noise. Like, she has a team behind her that's, like, really going hard for her. And she did a show out here at this place called Aisle 5. Aisle 5 is, like, maybe, like, a 300, 320 cap venue. She completely sells it out. And at the end of the show, everyone rushes to the back to her merch table to buy this $30 T-shirt that only had her name on it. No special designs, no special materials. I think it was, like, a Next Level T-shirt, that brand. Like, nothing like, no crazy anything. They just went and bought the shirt because they had fun at her show. And they wanted her to make some money. They wanted to su- they wanted to support her. And I say, you know, I mean, oftentimes it's not even that. Like, I mean, I've never thought I've I've really never bought anything except maybe like my friends, like at a friend show, mm-hmm. where I was like, I want to give this person my money. I don't really care about the shirt. It's usually that I care about the shirt. Yeah, yeah, uh, but, but but that's what that's what got me is because I've heard people. Say the opposite, like, oh, I would never just buy a shirt that just has your name on it or whatever. I'm like, yo, I, I watched, I watched at least like 85, 90 people go buy a T-shirt that only had her name on it because they enjoyed themselves. So, like, the point I was trying to relate to him is that a lot of the things that you're going to start monetizing to your fan base has less to do with the product itself and more about how you make them feel before they buy the product. So it's like, if if you, if I'm your fan and you make me feel like you're the best artist in the world and you're just so great to me, I buy whatever it is from you. Because like going back to, I want you to be able to thrive. I want to support you. I want to connect with other fans of yours and you know, show our allegiance to you, all that type of stuff. And I'm like, by you not even giving them the opportunity to support you, you're kind of disrespecting them because I was like, I, I had him do it one day. I was like, yo, just put on your story. If you put out merch, how many people would buy something for you? And he put it on his story and like 400 people was like, yo, I would buy something. I'm like, all right, cool. Most of them are cap. Maybe at least like 180 of them are really buy something. I'm like, but look at that, bro. You have 400 people who are literally telling you, I want to support you. Like, I want to help you become bigger yeah. than what you already are. And you won't give them that ability to do that because you're scared that they'll think you're monetizing them too early. Like, <laughs> I, I think also artists are like, it's it's so unnecessary because it's like, why why does someone ever like blast music? Like, why does mm-hmm. why don't we all just listen to music through headphones? I think it's like you know like, we we want to show other people that this music has something to do with who we are. Mm-hmm. Like, we're trying mm-hmm. to communicate something to people. So. Mm-hmm a t-shirt does that without you having to carry around a fucking speaker all the time. You know, yep, it tells yep. people like I am this shirt, this, everything you know about this artist, that's a lot of that's true for me. And it's mm-hmm. like, it's a way of like representing who we are as individuals. So I really think that like people buy this shirt to say like, I am this music or like, this is part of what you can expect from me, <laughs> you know? Yeah. To say, to say like, I belong to this, this, this social group or this, exactly, this idea, yeah. uh, this value. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Agree, man. Yeah, we, I, I th- like I'm I'm very interested. I love watching your guys' channel because, and also like, all of my friends in Orlando are now like in the new wave of not only the music industry but music promotion and business as well. And mm-hmm. I was trained and I learned in that old way. That's been like, if you could take a segment of like 1950 to like 2007 or 2008, you know, mm-hmm. like that music industry had these like, you know, these pretty predictable practices. And when I, when I first like started learning marketing and started helping my musician friends, it was against that, like that industry. But Mm -hmm. in the, in the meantime, this new industry has been like springing up and it's, it's kids like, you know, like all the kids that I'm friends with and like you and brand man, you know, who, the, just because a pathway is something that used to be black hat or used to be a little bit like disingenuous doesn't mean that it can't be renewed and presented in a different way. And now there's so much different music and so much different content out there that curators have become a lot more necessary than they were back then um, to just like filter it for you. And so I'm seeing all these like monetization pathways be so relevant in a different way. I'm seeing all these marketing methods be relevant in a new way. And it's, it's just cool to investigate, man. Like, um, and like for, for me, like it's always been like, no, we need to build your merch like immediately hundred percent. Um, and, and like, we need to not worry about top of funnel even at all. insofar as like, 
we only need to worry about top of funnel as much as we need middle of funnel volume, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and you know, like for, you know, like the music industry has always been like only top of funnel, like let's never monetize, you know? Um, let's until like, and let's let, let somebody else worry about it. And usually we're like signing away our lives to do that. Um, and it's just interesting to see artists getting it in an independent level through those old means. It's, it's super cool to watch. Um, and so I was, that, that's, that's why I asked <laughs> about the monetization stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's cool because like we get to be marketers at a time where I give it, man, I for real give it like another three to five years. And I think being the indie artist is going to be the cool thing to do. Like it's going to be cool to go like, oh, yeah, I don't make, you know what I'm saying, Drake money, but I'm not stuck in a six year contract. Man, I, I had one of my followers. One of my followers is getting courted by a label and he sent me the terms of his contract. And I was like, bro, that looks like slavery. Like that is slavery on paper. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and like, and, 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 like, it's not to say that like every label presents those type of contracts. But it's like, man, he's like this 18-year-old kid that even against the advice I'm giving him, I'm a thousand percent sure he's going to jump at it because that's all he knows. But thanks to people like like us, thanks to people like you guys, thanks to like all these these new wave industry people who are preaching like, yo, man, you don't need a label to do what you have to do. You can do this on your own and you might only make, you know what I'm saying, 50K this year, but at least you can afford to survive and figure out how you're going to make 100K next year. You know what I'm saying? Then you can afford to survive, how you gonna make 200K a year after that? And I think like the more that artists start to realize that, man, like that is when music industry is gonna get really interesting because the power is going to shift. Yeah. Artists, artists are gonna start being like more of the nucleus of the operation instead of just kind of being like the face of it, you know what I'm saying? Like the front man for it. And like, I think that's really cool because I look at, you know, um, at least coming from the, the rap community, man, it's like most rappers are like young black kids, right? So it's like no one's really teaching like a lot of young black kids about like entrepreneurship and how to like file your recordings through your costs on your taxes. But a lot more of them are starting to get interested in that. They're starting to figure that stuff out. And then they're going to start walking into these meetings, you know what I'm saying, saying things like, oh, I, I, when, let me double back. Let me. So going back to my, my friend that I keep bringing up, he just came back from L.A. where someone was trying to sign him. And he's talking to me. Like he was angry because of the conversation they had with him. And he's like, yeah, man, they're trying me. They were, they were telling me all these things they could offer me. But I'm telling, them, I'm telling them, like, I can't take this deal you want. This is all you have to offer because I know people that can do these things. And I stopped and I'm like, bro, like, think about that, man. Like, you would not have said that sentence like five years ago. You know what I'm saying? Like, like five years ago, there was no way that sentence would have come out your mouth. Like, you turned down a, a deal because you have the resources to get this stuff done. And that is the beauty of, like, where we're at today with marketing. So, like, it's, it's so um, cool to hear you say that, dude. I, I have very similar experiences. Um, when I was... Like, uh, I think like maybe it was four years ago now. I'm in uh, the kitchen of the recording studio I lived at. And do, are, are you familiar with Tyler Yahweh? Yeah, 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 yeah. So he came into the kitchen. He lived there at the time. And he had just been given a contract by NANR at Maybach Music Group, who, who anyone listening who knows, like, that sounds familiar. You probably know who I'm talking about. And he had just yeah. sent him a contract. And... And he gave it to me because I was the only one who could read legalese in the studio and we went over it. And since then, like that's been that's happened like, you know, twice a year. Like I'll, I'll help someone like understand a contract being thrown at them. And it's cool because like this last one that I helped with, like they didn't necessarily need me. Like there's people in the camp that were involved who pr like probably could have figured it out. And now that we have the internet and we have all these tools, like these kids are super smart and they're going to start figuring out what's going on yep. in these contracts all by themselves. Yep. And they're going to know what to negotiate. It's just a cool time, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. Like, it's, it's, it's really showing like how smart they are, man. Cause uh, I, I tell people, it's like, yo bro, a lot of the music industry is just about like knowing what you need to do, knowing who can do it and then being able to afford them. Like, that is the circle of the music industry life. And then making the content that's good enough that it actually works, you know, like having the stuff that works for it. And like I said, man, I think as a, a lot more artists start to realize that, the industry shift is going to be crazy. Because um, it's going to be like those few artists that do sign, it's going to be such a crazy, like, bidding war over them because 
they know they don't have to sign. And it's going to be like, oh, man. Like, I think, I think record contracts in like a couple years are going to be like stupid because they're going to, they're going to have to, it's like, you're going to have to give me some ridiculous number in order for me to sign stuff away to you knowing that I don't have to, you know? Totally. I mean, I just, I just, I just saw a contract that was like really bad very recently. And it was just so bad. It was untenable. Like it was like, no, you, you can't even negotiate with this. Like there's no, there's nothing to come back from with this. And so they're still throwing around like shitty paper in the industry a lot, but ho- hopefully like mm-hmm. it's, it's waning, you know, over time. Um, but yeah, man, it's just a super interesting time we're in. And, uh, it's definitely it's definitely like cool to watch. I, I just had to do our Spotify training, um, just because like we've been asked for a position statement on it by like our community for the longest time, and and so I was like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna investigate, I'm gonna learn everything I can, I'm gonna talk to all my friends who do this, I'm gonna do my own tests, and then I'm gonna come out with an answer for people, and and through that process, I learned that there's this major disparity, like. Certain genres, you can't make all your money from streaming. Certain genres, you can now. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like hip-hop, pop, youthful genres. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that, like, depending on how old you are, you spend more or less time on your cell phone, Instagram, and Spotify. Mm -hmm. You know, and, like, and that age gap is becoming more and more clear where, like, the monetization pathways are not identical depending on genre, depending on, like, what's hip right now. Um... So, like, before it was, like, it doesn't matter your genre necessarily. Like, you know, the use is pretty common, you know, among all people who are using these platforms. Like, there's not much of a difference. But now there's a clear disparity in terms of, like, how much an average fan on Spotify of a certain artist streams. Do you see that or do you just strictly deal with hip-hop? Um, so my rap clients definitely stream way better than my clients of other genres. But I think a lot of it has to do with just like streaming platforms now are definitely like really catering to hip hop. So it's like they're being built in a certain way where it's like it, it feels like they're being made for rappers to win specifically because that is the most popular genre of music right now. Um, but what I've noticed about some of my clients and my other genres is that they're kind of able to like monetize their like fan base or like the merch and stuff a little quicker because like the rap community, the rap community, uh, like just the things they value and just like where they place like money for stuff is a lot lower than fans of other genres. Like someone, someone, a rock band fan will go to a concert and drop like a hundred dollars in a heartbeat, but it takes right. a lot. It takes a lot of value in the product for a fan of a rapper to come do the exact same thing. You know, like I've had and friends, uh, what were you about to say? I was just going to say, like, it's it's also, like, there's a difference in terms of brand loyalty mm-hmm. from both camps, mm-hmm. like, in terms of what clothes you wear. Like, it's not a simple decision for the average hip-hop fan, like, oh, yeah, I'll just wear this dude's T-shirt. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it's like, oh, man, okay, cool, you want 30 for the T-shirt? What else do I get? It's like, what? What do you mean? Like, you get these memories and this great time. But, like I said, I've had friends <laughs> who are into other genres of music, and they'll drop, like, $80, $100 on stuff without even thinking about it. But then they won't do the same thing for, like, the rappers they like. And it's like, man, it's just the, the culture of it is so different. It's like I, I'm starting to see that for some genres, for some instances, you can you can have, like, a 2X where the customer creation is all done with small merchandise products, and that feeds literally the entire rest of the business. Mm-hmm. And then all your profit, all your top-line profit is, like, back-end high ticket. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like, I, I don't know, like for, for hip hop artists, it's kind of harder. Like it's, it's so hard to get a hip hop or a pop artist or any artist that's like really, really particular about their brand and how they come off mm-hmm. to monetize with merchandise. So I definitely identify with what you were saying. Um, but like, also like once, once you have like that huge top of funnel awareness, like I feel like there's so much opportunity there with merchandise, especially when it's untapped. And I'm sure that's like a typical situation for you, right? Like, is that like you're just trying to help them monetize what they've built? Yeah. And and, and, and like merch is crazy because like when people say merch, they think like T-shirts, hats, yeah, hoodies. But it's like merch really expands across however creative you can get with what you want to make. Like, um, I'm trying to think of an artist example. I, well, so, like, one of the coolest merch things I first got, like, from an artist I like was there was this artist named Rory 
And like two, three years ago, he was selling like these custom matchboxes. Like, and yeah. I remember at the time, like, I was like, man, this is so cool. Like, I've never seen this before. Like, he was selling like really eclectic, like merch ideas, um, like merchandising products. And I think like that box of matches maybe was maybe something like ten dollars. And what you can get a box of matches from the store for like maybe like maybe like two or three dollars for a box way bigger than that. So I mean, I mean the the big thing, and I got this from you guys actually was like figuring out the the creative like high profit margin items that you can put out there that like other people aren't doing because it's like everyone is doing a t-shirt. But, you know, how many people are selling, you know, branded water guns? You right. Know, like, yeah, like if totally. I, like, if I, like, if, like if an artist I liked was selling a water gun for like $40, I would buy it because that's like cool as fuck. It's like who else is doing something like this? Or like yeah. we, we booked an artist for a show out here who was talking about um, his inspiration behind merchandise is like Travis Scott, right? And what's funny about Travis Scott is people love his merch ideas but Travis Scott's team literally goes to like Amazon, buys these items, and then just like stamps the Astro World logo on it, and then marks them up like five hundred percent. Yeah, um, or, I remember or that, Alibaba, I remember, they might be drop shipping that shit. It's like classic yeah, marketer stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's like, man, like I remember when he did Astro World. One of the things he was selling was like glow in the dark star stickers, and it's like <laughs> that's like on its on its own. That's nothing amazing, but when but because of the theme of the album and how it branded was, like his fan base ate that shit up. They're like, right. oh shit, he stickers, like yeah, let's do it. So like I tried to like stress that with artists, like bro, your merchandising game is only as weak or as strong as you make it. You know what I'm saying? Like however creative you decide to get with this, because like you said, man, there's a there's a drop shipping website, there's a there's a merchandiser, there's a there's a wholesale warehouse somewhere that can make whatever you can think of. It's just about the research and the time into it and then the money to be able to afford it. I always tell people like a touchstone example that I love both because it's like probably one of the best examples, but also because people hate this band uh, is Insane Clown Posse. <laughs> They're, they uh, have yeah. the <laughs> biggest merchandising outfit like in the music industry right now, like except for maybe Kiss like back in the day, you know? and. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows who the fuck they are and nobody likes them except for this like small niche audience. And they're like, you know, millionaires because of their merchandise, like, and how creative they are with it. So yeah, t totally. <laughs> yeah, man. It's like artists are literally an e-commerce store with their music just being to ask for it. And I, I think that like, I think yeah. that's, that's kind of another core component of just like getting artists to understand the business side is getting them to see that. Well, a lot of artists put, they think, most of the monetary value is going to come from the music itself. So like, oh, I just need to get X amount of streams or I need to get X amount of views and I'll really start making money. And it's like, well, yes, to an extent, but you know what's a lot easier than selling, you know what I'm saying? You know what's a lot easier than getting 10 million streams is selling 50 t-shirts. And, you know, yeah. like, depending on, the depending on the price point, you might end up cracking around like the same amount of money. You know, like, it's easier to sell, it's easier to sell 200, or uh, 400 stickers than it is to get two, three million streams, especially as an indie artist. I mean, you like if you, I know a guy who's who's Spotify is doing like a million a month in terms of streams, mm. which is not easy to get to. And mm -hmm. and like, uh, you know, you could get like an HR job and make more money than his profile does. Yeah, exactly. Like, I've seen some sad streaming checks before. Yeah, for like. Totally. The numbers you thought, you'd be like, man, I thought this would be crazy in there. But it's like, oh, but um, yeah, man, the, the merchandising thing is just like, like, because a lot of, like I said, since a lot of my clients are like rappers, um, their whole like mindset that some of them come into is just it's so different. So I try to coach them and I'm like, bro, like if you, if you have this set up out the gate and you can really sell your brand, you really sell your image, you really, you know, you make good music, you make high quality videos, you're consistent, you engage you will start making money pretty quickly. You know, like, it, it just becomes a matter of, like, like time and patience with it at that point. Okay, so if you, if, and, like, so, okay, the re I'm going to ask you to outline sort of, like, your order of operations in terms of, like, how you would walk an artist from, all right, you're not doing anything yet to, like, where you think they should go. What, what does that look like? Like, what are the steps? The, the first thing I always try to start out with, with the artists, I always like to have a conversation of what resources do you have access to? Because that's going to change a lot of the things that we can do. 
So like I have some artists who have a full in-house, you know, production media team, which is like their friends with cameras, but they can crank out three music videos a month and then get me high quality, you know, videos to work on stuff on Instagram every single month. Whereas I may have another artist who doesn't have access to really anything. He just has like a studio and then it's like a little different because I have to I have to coach him, coach him and her through like different practices. But usually what I like to do, so um if it's like a let's imagine release, that content's no object. Yeah, yeah. So first thing I do is I try to push them to get a video. If they don't if they don't have a video, I'm like, all right, cool. Let's build up some social proof on your streaming sites using like playlists. So month one may be like month one, month two may be like, okay, let me get you placed on five to ten playlists. Let's build a song up to a certain point. Um, so that hopefully by the end of this two or three month period, you've had time to go shoot and get a video made. So once the video is out, um, I like to start building up their platforms using paid advertising. So it's like, all right, let's lose, let's use uh, a IG ad or a Facebook ad to start building up your Instagram numbers. Let's start using YouTube ads to start building up your YouTube, um, your video numbers on YouTube, getting more social proof on there because I'm, I'm assuming if it's a good product, we'll get a good amount of likes, we'll get a good amount of comments, we'll get a good amount of um, follows from it. And the whole social proofing thing gets there. So this is this in my head is month three, four, and five. I like to stick to pay advertising. Month six and out is when I like to start diving into influencer marketing and like viral campaign marketing. So at this point, it's like, all right, cool. We have the social proof. Well, even before I get into that, so I'll explain my reasoning why. So the reason I like to wait until then to get into it is I feel like if you go too heavy with the influencers really heavy on, it looks like you're paying to market yourself, which I don't know how it is in every other genre, but it's like for some reason, rap fans hate to know that an artist is paying money to promote themselves. It's the wildest thing ever. Like, they, they shit on you for it. Oh, bro, like, you pay to get on this post. It's like, yeah, right. I want you to see it. Like, what you Right, do? right. But um, so, so the way I've kind of found to get around that is like, all right, if we build up social proof first, if this fan goes to your YouTube channel and your video has 500 streams, they're going to shit on you immediately because it's like, oh, man, this guy clearly paid for this. But if they go to your YouTube channel, check out the video, and you have, you know, 85,000 streams and, like, 120 comments, then they'll think differently. They'll go like, hmm, maybe he didn't pay to promo this. Right. Maybe. Or at least it won't seem as weird. Like, even if you don't exactly. think, like, because you probably won't consciously think, like, Oh, I, I don't know if he paid to promote it. You probably just would like not see 500 views and you'd be like, all right, I'm going to listen to this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah, he definitely did. So like, so for the psychological reasons of that alone, I like to start including like um, viral marketing and influencer marketing a little later down the line. Um, now, by this point, by the time we get to this point, I've, I'm getting them to establish like an email list. And um, if they already have a website or a merch up, um, this is the point where I'm starting to convince them to like put together a really strong like um, like content schedule for the platforms we're working. So we can start to just stay active on that and they can push people uh, to these, to these, to their merchandise or to their websites or whatever to like buy stuff. Right. Um, and then from that point, I usually start to like doing well. Even my my advertising strategy is usually to like build up a really large audience of people that have seen the client, and then spend the next five, six, seven, eight months just working them within that group of people who have seen them and shown to like them. So like if I get if we get you know uh, if we reach I don't know 1.5 million people on a Facebook ad, and you know we get at least. 120,000 of them to to watch at least 50% of the video. Then I'm like, all right, cool. Let's take the next three months to keep working you inside this group of 120,000 people who, for some reason, were slightly interested in you. Right. And let's see if we can convert, you know, 15,000 of them into real, uh, into followers and then convert another, you know, convert 4,000 of them into actual fans and then start planning shit out from there. Um, yeah. And then, like, the and then the ones who... Who can afford to stick it out longer or who, like I said, stick it out longer in general for whatever reasons. Um, I like to start dipping into like really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like really specific 
location targeting, I guess, where it's like, all right, we've been running kind of a general idea. The spring is coming up or the summer's coming up. I want you to be able to tour or do shows. We see that, you know, Miami, Houston, New York, Atlanta, and I don't know, Reno are all doing really well for you. Let's start, um, let's start running ads to build you out in these markets specifically so that we can start to kind of leverage our own connections um, or our own resources to start getting you shows and be able to bring you out there. Well, mm-hmm. I, a really cool, a really cool example of that is I have this R and B client I work with. Um, her name is Hadassah. She's a really like really great singer from New York, and I, I never told her this when we first started working together, but I I told her this past weekend because we booked her for an event I do here in Atlanta called Blue Summer. So like Blue Summer is like this festival that me and my friends put together on like this film, music, and art festival. And so when I first started working with her. I really liked her music. And I was like, man, I would love to bring her to Atlanta. So every time she would hire me to do a marketing campaign, I would always target Atlanta specifically for her stuff because I knew there would come a point in time where I could leverage my resources and my connections to get her a show out here, to bring her out here to be able to perform in front of those people. And we made that happen this past weekend, you know, as of us recording this video, That's this awesome. past weekend. <laughs> Um, so like I try to look at stuff like that, like, all right, let's go from general, really general audience building to, um, to then starting to work some of the psychological, uh, like psych- psychological components of like social media and like fan building. And then let's break it down even further, like segment a little bit, uh, smaller into these individual pockets that we can push you in. So you can start to make like some real life progress, like going to shake some hands and kiss some babies and do all that cool stuff. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I mean, it's so cool to hear kind of like that outline. Like it tracks, it tracks a lot with like what I might recommend to somebody um, starting from zero. And and but there's definitely a, a, a preponderance of like, you know, more viral marketing or more social proof like oriented campaigns. And in the past, like mm-hmm. I've definitely spoken badly about like social proof as a as like a main objective. Um but in the music industry, like it's always been that way, that social proof is the main objective. And yeah, I've definitely had to check my dogma a little bit, like in in recent times, just to sort of like audit, like, okay, am I not paying enough attention to social proof? Because like in a way it does matter. I was listening to a digital marketer perpetual traffic uh, podcast episode where they were talking to this like duo who are like dominating Instagram right now. And they were saying like, look, like someone comes to your profile And there's like 500 people on it in terms of followers. It's going to be a lot different than if there's, you know, 5,000 or 50,000. Like the Mm -hmm. likelihood that they're going to like you, the likelihood that they're going to check out your content is much, much lower, like 10% or less. And I was like, you know, as much as I don't like campaigns that are solely focused on making people feel famous, that's a huge good point. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Cause, I mean, it goes back to the, the psychological thing, man. Like, people are such bandwagoners. Like, yeah. it's, it's crazy to think. It, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about people kind of wrapping their self-identity in, like, artists they like or what they represent and stuff. To where it's like, man, I need to know that someone else feels represented by you before I start to make the conscious decision to decide whether or not I want you to represent me. Totally. And yeah. it's, it, it is the weirdest, in my opinion, the weirdest thing ever but that's just how it is. So it's like, you got to play the game. Well, we had a, um, this one artist we booked, this guy named Suave. He did a, uh, we did an interview with him on the Blue Summer channel. And he kind of brought the concept of like, him and his team refer to people as like general population. And just like the I, the way that Jim Pop thinks. And they, they do that to kind of manipulate what you were talking about. Like that's making people, <laughs> like making people feel like, they're stupid for not knowing who he is. That's like his whole team's marketing. Like what they will, they will post him on, let's say like, I don't know, let's say like at rap, which is a rap based Instagram page. They'll post him and James Blake in the studio and the caption will be like, it won't be like, oh, rising artist Suave with James Blake. It'll be like Suave and James Blake in the studio. Yeah. And then to the person like me that sees it, it's like, who the fuck is Suave? You know what I'm saying? Why don't I know about Suave? And then they go right. dive into it and check it out. You see the numbers, you see all the stuff that his team behind is pushing. And it goes like, oh, here's this artist that some way slipped under my radar. I need to do all I can to catch up on it. 
And it's yeah. wild, man. Like I've ran, I've ran like ad campaigns before where like the video would like start off at zero, like nothing, and it wouldn't be getting like any engagement. And then I would tell the artist like, yo, get all your friends to go comment on the video and just like comment random shit that has something to do with the video and like it. And then they would do it, and then like a day into the campaign, the engagement would start going up. And I'm like, yes, yeah, because people see other people comment. Like, it's, uh, it's totally, yeah. Fun, we man, call but. it we we <laughs> call it priming your posts before you run like a top of funnel ad. It's like you got to prime that. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah, man, it's it's interesting. It's super interesting, um, and kind of the, I I guess like we've always focused on like social proof will come if you run good advertising that's focused on the money like monetizing your whole operation, then like you'll get social proof if it's done right. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like you can also get money from getting social proof. Like if you build up a huge Instagram channel, like you can just organically post and get sales. Like, so Mm -hmm. yeah, man, it's, it's, it's a double edged sword. I'll say that like, and, and certainly like for some genres, there is no social proof Avenue. Like for some types of artists, like they're so niche that, you know, like they just can't chase that sort of avenue. Um, they need to find like their small audience. But yeah, man, I'm, I'm more and more like I'm, I'm seeing the value of like certain like high top of funnel strategies. It's super cool to hear you talk about them in like in an integrated manner with the type of stuff we do. That's super cool. Um, where, wh- okay. So where do people find you and you know, how do people get in contact with you if they, if they want to? Yeah, man. The best way to get in contact with me is on Instagram. Um, at Corey the Savior, K O H R E Y D A S A V I O R. Um, you can come come hit me on that, DM me. Um, I will get back to you. I may not get back to you immediately, but I will get back to you. Um, other than that, man, I'm just kind of around on like YouTube and Twitter sometimes. You can catch me on there. But Instagram is definitely the best place. <laughs> it's like my second home. Hell yeah. I highly recommend that everyone goes and checks out both uh, Corey and Brandman um, and and all of Corey's videos. I'm, I'm a huge fan of you guys. And thank you guys so much for doing what you do. And I'm super excited to see more from you guys in the future. Yeah, man. Appreciate it, man. Thank you for bringing me on here too, man. Dude, no problem. Thank you. And we'll see the rest of you indies next week on Creative Juice.